Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is uh, good to be with you uh, on YouTube. Uh, I would have preferred to be with you in person and was very much uh, looking forward to being with everyone again today at church. But I also hope and pray uh, that you are all safe and healthy and uh, are able to connect with each other uh, through these times of being apart. Uh, I have missed being with you all although I did get a chance to watch some of the videos from the teaching and know you have had great teaching uh, these last uh, several weeks. So this morning we're gonna try something a little bit new. As you see, I'm not uh, in the sanctuary. I'm actually at home uh, trying to live stream this morning. And so we were gonna try, try it this way. Uh, we've told our staff uh, to stay home as well. And so rather than have a couple of us come in to the sanctuary, I said I'd try it uh, from home and hopefully this works uh, in a way that, that works for all of us. Uh, we're going to do a couple things. Uh, first, I want to say thank you uh, to Sandy for getting everything out to you. I will say to Jim, I miss your coffee. Uh, I'm trying, but it's not nearly the same uh, as we, uh, I still have something to drink this morning, but it's not uh, not the same as it came from y'all. But I am glad uh, to, to be able to at least connect uh, this way. Um, what we're going to do is the same, same rhythm. We're going to pray for each other. Uh, the way we're going to do prayer requests is I have an email from Ellen Rose uh, with some updates uh, that, that you all have shared. I'm going to share with you all this morning, and then we'll pray uh, together. Um, I'm going to ask you not to use the comment section on YouTube to, to give prayer requests. Instead, just send them to Sandy, and then she can compile them uh, and send them to uh, the pastoral team so that we can be praying if you have any beyond uh, what I shared this morning uh, or any updates. Uh, next week, what I hope we'll do is email San Sandy by Sunday afternoon, uh, any prayer requests, and then I'll just share those um, on Monday morning uh, when we're together for uh, for class. And so that's how we'll try to do that to stay connected. But I know you're talking to each other. I know many pastors have reached out in the last several weeks, and so hopefully we'll stay connected that way uh, week to week. Uh, so this morning I want to share, I do have a, an email from Ellen. This is what Ellen has shared with me. Uh, and so um, a couple of, a couple updates and prayer requests for today. Uh, one is uh, that Jana Fifi uh, is recuperating from pneumonia. Uh, is on oxygen with healthcare assistance uh, at the part of Woodland Terrace that is now on lockdown. And so uh, some of you may have seen that there is a case of, of COVID-19 at Woodland Terrace. That is where Jane is. And so do please pray for Jane uh, and her recovery there uh, and encouragement in a, in a scary time. Also, Marilyn and Tony Alb's daughter uh, is continuing her extensive treatment for breast cancer. Uh, in these tenuous times, and again, would appreciate prayer. Uh, their nephew and family are also in northern Italy, and so be praying for the Ob family, um, especially. Uh, Janet Davis is in the midst of radiation treatment uh, for breast cancer uh, following a lumpectomy, as uh, so continue to pray for Janet and, and for John as they um, journey through uh, breast cancer, this breast cancer healing uh, process. Uh, Jane Elmore uh, continues healing at home. Uh, for a broken ankle. And then Phyllis Lambert uh, is between segments of treatment uh, for cancer and having some symptoms uh, that are requiring assessment. So be praying for Phyllis, Phyllis Lambert uh, as well. Uh, also, I talked to Ann Yeager yesterday. Um, Gresham is actually doing better uh, than we had uh, expected. Uh, and so that's, that's good news, but they still can't see each other. So they are separated at Glen Eyre. Uh, so they talk on the phone a couple times a day. Uh, that sometimes is well, sometimes does not go well. And so just be praying for the two of them um, as, and during this time as well, especially for Gresham's healing, that he can get home um, in these next few weeks. If there are other prayer requests, I'm going to just give us a minute of silence uh, this morning. And so I invite you to take a minute to uh, say aloud right where you are, maybe with, with a spouse or whomever you're with this morning, uh, or just write it down or go ahead and send an email to Sandy uh, with those prayer requests. And I'll give us about 30 seconds for that. Uh, let us let us pray this morning. Let's pray. Almighty God, uh, this morning as we come before you, uh, we are reminded of just how vulnerable uh, our lives might be. Uh, that so many that we know are sick 
and suffering um, in our community, in our families, in our church, and around the world already. And now with this new uh, new virus uh, that is impacting our communities, Lord, um, we pray that your a healing hand, a protective hand would be, uh, would be among us. It would give us courage to seek you. And also give us courage to uh, be a light uh, when there is darkness around, to be hopeful and to be a people who love well uh, even when we cannot be physically together. Lord, help us to see with your eyes and hear with your ears. Lord, we pray for uh, all those we've looked at aloud already this, this morning, for those that have been on our hearts. We know that you hear our prayers. We pray for our leaders, our worldwide leaders, as well as our uh, leaders in this nation, our president, our Congress, our governors, our mayors, our local leaders, as they try to help uh, keep us safe. Lord, for all of those that are caring for the sick, for doctors, nurses, first responders, everyone in healthcare, Lord. We pray that you would um, protect them as they seek to care for others. Lord, for teachers and other workers in our communities, for businesses that are seeking to care for the sick right now, Lord, even when that's not what they normally would do, or for teachers that are, are finding ways to teach our kids from a distance, from all those who are far away, Lord, we pray uh, that your strength and courage be with them. And that you would remind us this day that your Holy Spirit is always with us. And that there is no distance that your spirit cannot cover. Lord, may your spirit rest with us today. In Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. And I would just encourage you all, as you know, to if you have anything, if you need anything, uh, please do reach out to me, to any one of our pastors, Pastor Laura, Pastor Sheila, uh, Pastor Ellen, uh, Pastor Alta. Uh, any one of our team um, at the Apex Campus as well as across our system, I know we'd be happy to uh, to care, uh, come alongside any way we can. But also to check, check on each other. Uh, if there's folks that you've not heard from, uh, reach out, make a phone call, send a card, uh, and, and certainly reach out to each other to remind um, one another uh, that we are loved in this time. And so I'd encourage you, especially today, um, to, to call each other maybe when we're done, send a text message, just say hello, uh, that we're thinking about you as we uh, we gather here um, this morning in a different way. Um, so we're going to shift a little bit and we're going to move towards um, scripture today. We're going to be studying uh, Mark chapter 10, uh, which is uh, a long chapter. Uh, Mark 10 is uh, verses uh, 1 uh, through 52. And so we're going to break it up in parts. I'm not going to read all 52 verses to start. We're going to read it uh, in different blocks uh, this morning. Um, I have set a timer. Uh, so I'm going to try to keep us on time. I have a hard enough time, as y'all know, as it is. And so I'm going to try to uh, keep us on time uh, this morning as we go through this. Um, I will tell you, I warn you ahead of time, we're going to spend a lot more time on the first uh, you know, 15 or 20 verses than we will on the last uh, 20 or so verses. But we'll uh, we'll get into that uh, in a minute. Before we jump into Mark, though, um, I do want to invite us to pray uh, this prayer for illumination. Uh, hopefully you all uh, received outlines from Sandy last night via email. Um, on a PDF, and so I've got mine printed out right here, uh, and so we'll use these the same way that we um, have been, but the prayer for illumination is on the very back of your outline uh, on page eight. Uh, so we're going to pray this out loud uh, together. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as your scriptures are read and your word proclaimed we may hear with joy of what you say to us today. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so we're going to be moving into Mark uh, chapter 10. Uh, Pastor Sheila led us through Mark 9 uh, last week. And so we're going to begin um, this morning with Mark 10 uh, verses 1 through 12. So I want you to open your Bibles with me to Mark 10, and I'm going to read out loud uh, verses 1 through 12. Hear this word from Mark's gospel. Jesus left that place and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. And crowds again gathered around him, 
And as was his custom, he again taught them. Some Pharisees came, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Uh, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Uh, so a nice, easy one to start. <laughs> uh, so we're going to jump in uh, to this. And I'm going to begin uh, with Mark uh, 10, verse 1. And so what we're going to see uh, is just a reminder kind of of where we are in this region. When I taught the first four chapters, I uh, used this map uh, a couple times. And so I want to kind of reposition us in that region. And so when we get to Mark 10, uh, verse 1, this is what it says. He left that place and went to the region of Judea and beyond uh, the Jordan. So I invite you to, to turn to your map and just a reminder of kind of where, where we are. Hopefully you'll, you have this, but you can see uh, where we are. Uh, and in this map, we're reminded the first nine chapters of Mark take place in the region on your map uh, called Galilee. And so this is the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, the, the northernmost part, um, the part that does not include Jerusalem. And so you have uh, Galilee and then Samaria in the middle and uh, Judea uh, in the southern region. Uh, Judea, of course, where Jerusalem and Bethlehem uh, are. Judea is the center of Jewish power. Uh, this was uh, the southern kingdom in Israel. If you remember our history from uh, the book of Daniel and from other places, this is where Babylon came in and Nebuchadnezzar took over. But before that, the Assyrians came in and took the northern kingdom. And so uh, that's how it was divided. And Samaria becomes a place where uh, there are people with Jewish heritage but have intermarried many of them. And so you have a mixed culture in Samaria. And so again, you re remember these things. We hear these stories of Jesus that in different regions... Uh, he is reaching a different group of people. Um, in the northern region, Galilee, uh, you have Nazareth where he was born, or not where he was born, where he's from, where, his, where Joseph and Mary are from. But of course, Bethlehem was where he was born. So he was born close to Jerusalem, but he uh, lived and was raised uh, presumably in Nazareth uh, where Mary's from. And so we come to chapter 10. In the first nine chapters, he has been serving in Galilee. So these are people that are uh, like his family, known to him. They know him. Um, and then we get to chapter 10, and we begin this journey uh, to Judea, uh, likely down the Jordan River, as he begins to move beyond the Jordan uh, down towards Jericho. We're going to finish this chapter in Jericho uh, as he moves that down that region. Uh, eventually, by chapter 11, we get to Jerusalem. We start to move towards that road to Jerusalem in the last weeks of his life. And so that's kind of where we are in his ministry, as he's taught among friends and family. And now he's moving into a broader region uh, where people don't know him as well, perhaps and his, his, his fame is growing. So even as he moves beyond the Jordan River, crowds come to him. That's what it says in verse 10 or verse 1. And crowds again gather around him. And as this was his custom, uh, he taught them. Uh, so even outside of his hometowns, people are hearing about Jesus, learning about Jesus. And they're wanting to come in crowds to, to see him and to hear him teach. And so this is what happens next. And there's two things that are going to happen in this, in this passage. One is a very important teaching uh, on, on marriage and what Jesus believes about marriage. And another is an important piece on how Jesus reads scripture. I think it'd be very helpful for us to go through both of those um, in this passage. And so in verse uh, 2 through 12, it says, uh, First, um, some Pharisees come, and to test him they asked, uh, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Um, now we see this pattern in scripture in several places where uh, Pharisees or scribes will come, and they will try to test Jesus. So they'll ask a question of Jesus that uh, they're hoping to catch him in some loophole in the law uh, or in some uh, legal theory that if he answers one way, uh, he gets caught in it. If he answers another way, he gets caught in it. And so you see this uh, several other places. 
And, and what we're going to see this morning is how Jesus responds to that test. So he knows they're testing him. He knows that their heart. Uh, he knows what they're trying to do. And so this is what it says. Uh, Jesus answered them uh, first in a way he often does uh, with a question. So he says, what did Moses command you? So Jesus looks backward towards scripture. When they ask him a question that's intended to trick him, that's intended to be a very uh, narrow question, he starts by asking about the tradition of the church, in this case, the tradition of the temple. Uh, and he looks at what scripture says. What did Moses say? What did the law actually say? Uh, this is what they say. Now, verse four. Uh, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce um, or a certificate of dismissal uh, and to divorce her. Um, I made a note on your outline where this comes from. Uh, this is Deuteronomy 24, uh, verses 1 through 4. Uh, we're not going to read it uh, this morning, but uh, you can go back and look at it and read through that actual passage. And what it effectively does is Moses gives permission uh, for a man in that culture to dismiss, to dismiss or divorce his wife. And then she can go marry someone else. And then that man can also divorce um, his wife. But the power is always with uh, the male in that culture uh, to dismiss or divorce their wife. And what the law protects is her ability to remarry so that she as a, as a uh, divorcee is not um, without some protection uh, in that culture. And so you see that written into the law. And so uh, that's, that's what they said. This is what they said. But this is what he wrote. Moses wrote. Then verse 5. Uh, but Jesus said to them, he basically said, this is why the law exists. Because of your hardness of heart, Moses wrote this commandment for you. But, and I love what he does here. Uh, Jesus looks at a very uh, narrow question from a very uh, small part of scripture, one through four. And he says, if we're going to read this law in the context of God's kingdom and what God would have us do, we have to read it in this broad context. Uh, we can't just read it uh, in these four verses. We have to go and really look at it from all of God's design, all of God's creation, all of what God wants to do. So it's Jesus takes them to the back, back to the very beginning, which is an important move here. We'll see why that matters in a few minutes. But he says this, uh, verse 6. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And so you see Jesus uh, pointing back to the very beginning uh, to emphasize how important marriage is, uh, the joining of people together from the beginning, from the intent of God's, of God's creation. And so uh, when they're asking about divorce and they point to this uh, one narrow part of scripture uh, to uh, catch uh, Jesus in a test, he says, well, let's think about what God wants for all of creation. And let's go to the very beginning to talk about what that, um, what that might, might mean. I've also linked there uh, Genesis 1, 26 through 27. Um, that's the place um, that he's referencing. It's the direct quotes uh, really uh, from there. And then again, from Genesis chapter two, you see both creation narratives there uh, where God creates man, uh, creates male and female and tends them to uh, enter into this relationship where two become one. It becomes an image of God's uh, covenant relationship with the church it's used throughout scripture. Uh, but you see how, how he emphasizes that. Um, what I want to do now is actually go uh, to another place. We're going to go to Matthew 22. So I would invite you to turn uh, in your Bibles to Matthew uh, 22, 23 uh, through 33. Because this is the other thing that Jesus often does um, when it comes to um, talking about what Scripture means, what this, um, what these laws mean, what, what, how do we deal with the Mosaic law in Jesus' time. And one is he goes to the beginning. He talks about what it means in the beginning. The other thing that he'll often do is talk about what it means in the kingdom of God or in the resurrection. Like, so not only uh, what does God intend for us in the beginning, but what does God intend for us uh, in the resurrection at the, at the end of time? Uh, and so this is what, uh, this is what he says. This is 22, uh, verse 23 through 33. Uh, and again, you see this time Sadducees uh, coming really to challenge and test uh, Jesus. It says, the same day some Sadducees came to him saying there is no resurrection. 
And they asked Jesus a question saying, teacher, Moses said, again, looking back to the, mo the law of Moses, if a man dies childless, his brother shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. So they're quoting a, a one line law in the, the law of Moses. Uh, verse 25, here's their test of Jesus. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died childless, leaving the widow to his brother. The second uh, did the same, so also the third, uh, down to the seventh. So you see uh, in the Mosaic law, if, if a brother uh, or if a, a man marries a woman and, and he dies and there's no children, then um, if the second brother can marry her and on and on and on. So she has now been married uh, in this trap, in this test, in the story out of seven different brothers. It almost becomes a riddle that they're trying to trap Jesus in. So it says, verse 27, a last of all, the woman herself died. In the resurrection, then, whose wife of the seven will she be? For all of them had married her. Verse 29, and Jesus answered them, you are wrong, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is God, not of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. And so here you have another place where Jesus talks about marriage. And we talk about marriage again, another place where he's trapped where the Sadducees in this case, Pharisees and other Sadducees are trying to test him and they come to him and he says, in the first case in Mark, uh, look backward to creation. You know, how were we created? What were you created for? And in the second case, look forward to the resurrection. What will it look like in the resurrection? Uh, and in both cases, uh, you see him challenging uh, this sort of uh, one line reading of the Mosaic law to try to build an ethic. Uh, where he says we need to build a full ethic that undertakes all of Scripture into account, all of God's purposes into account, and that's how we uh, read Scripture. And I think this becomes really important for us uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, we as United Methodists obviously are having uh, conversations with our denomination right now, uh, but even uh, prior to that, we've had hard conversations about what Scripture means and how do we read Scripture. Uh, you know, one of the ways we've done that is is to talk about uh, what it means to have female clergy and how do we how do we read scripture through this pattern of reading scripture as a whole, looking forward to, you know, backward to the Old Testament, to what the Old Testament says, but also forward to what God uh, designs for us and how we hold those things in tension. And one of the places we've done that is with female clergy. I just want to share this with you as an example of how we can take what Jesus does in Mark's gospel and apply it to other uh, places, other decisions that we've made as a church. And so what I've done on, on, your, um, on your outline is giving you the place um, that is debated about whether um, women should be clergy. This is a debate we don't have in the Methodist Church. We believe very, very much so um, that not only uh, should they be clergy, but women are great clergy, and they have led and, and taught us well. They're great leaders in our church. They should be pastors that, that preach and teach. But there was a time, there are many traditions that still don't believe that, and this is where that comes from. So what I put in front of you is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 through 12. This is what Paul teaches about female leadership. Uh, Paul writes, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Also, that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided or with gold, pearls, or expensive clothes, but with good works, as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. And then verses 11, this is 11 and 12 are the places this comes from. I let a woman learn in silence uh, with full submission. Uh, you can laugh at that. <laughs> I permit no woman uh, to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. So here's Paul making a very clear statement about the role of women when it comes to teaching and preaching and having authority in the church. And this is a passage that's been used uh, in many traditions, it's still used today uh, to prevent women from becoming pastors in certain traditions. 
of the church. Of course, we've made a different decision as United Methodists. And we've made it not just because we feel like it, like we just feel like it should be different. We've made it through an examination of Scripture and by asking the same questions uh, that Jesus asked, which is, what did Moses say? What, what did the Old Testament say? What was the intent from the Old Testament? What was How did God behave? How did God's people behave in other times? And how does God see this coming true in the resurrection and the kingdom of God moving forward? And so how do we today behave in the way that God would have us behave, you know, in, in the future as we move towards the kingdom of God and resurrection? So I'll, I'll put two places. The first is an, an Old Testament reference, and there's several of them. This is the one I wanted to draw out. Uh, it's about Deborah. And we studied Deborah uh, last summer. Uh, we studied Judges. And Deborah was a leader uh, in the church or in the Israelite people. She was a leader. She was a prophetess. A prophet, of course, is someone who speaks on behalf of God. And so it was Deborah's job to bring God's voice to God's people. She was a spokesperson for God. And so if this is not an argument for female clergy, then this is exactly where this comes from, that Deborah was that very thing. Uh, she was one that was God's spokesperson uh, to pastor, to lead, to shepherd uh, God's people into a new way of life. That's what it says. It's on your outline. Or Judges 4, verses 4 through 7. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lapidoth, uh, was judging Israel. Uh, she used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, Take position at Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. And so when we ask this question, should women be pastors? Should women be uh, able to speak on behalf of God to God's people and to men in particular? Here we have in the Old Testament, a female leader of Israel uh, who is clearly leading a man, in this case, Barak, son of Abinoam, and telling Barak what the word of God says, the God of Israel commands you. This is what God is telling you to go and do. And so here's an example in the Old Testament. Again, that's not the only thing, the only thing Jesus does. Jesus also looks forward to the resurrection, to the kingdom of God. Um, this is the passage in Galatians 3. This is also Paul writing, Paul in his letter to the Galatians, uh, when he talks about what the kingdom of God, what it means to be in Christ looks like. This is what he says, Galatians 3, uh, 23 through 29, also on your outline. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now faith has come. We are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. And so Paul is trying to position, much like Jesus did in Mark, Trying to position the place of the law of Moses in the time of Christ. And this is what he says about um, uh, what that might mean. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So that's the conclusion. Then verse 28, this is the, the part of the, what we see as the shift uh, for the kingdom of God as it relates to male and female. He says, there is no longer Jew or Greek there is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And so as Paul talks about this same thing, he talks about how uh, all the separations we put on culture, we put on people, society, um, in our current state, our current existence, uh, puts on people, uh, male, uh, Jew or Greek, a uh, slave or free, a uh, male or female, uh, in the resurrection that goes away. And if you look back to creation, what we just talked about in the passage from Mark, uh, when it talks about in the beginning, God created human, and then uh, from, if you remember the story from Genesis chapter 2, uh, from one human being, 
I divided that into two, to male and female, and then they try to become one again. Mary is about becoming one again. You see, in the resurrection, it's also about becoming one again. That's the, that's the end goal. And so this idea, just like Jesus said in the resurrection, uh, this idea of marriage doesn't mean the same thing it means now. Uh, like you're missing the point. Uh, Paul says uh, the same thing. He says in the resurrection, uh, this, this idea of male or female doesn't mean the same thing that it means right now. And so that becomes important for Paul and then important for us as United Methodists when we talk about what it means for female to be clergy. And so this is, this is one way to read Scripture. And so I think it's just important for us as we read Mark's gospel and hear Jesus talk about Scripture. Uh, when he's tested with a hard question, uh, that's what Jesus does. When Jesus looks back to the Old Testament, uh, looks forward to the resurrection, and talks about what it means uh, for these things to be true, um, true among us. And so I think that's what we have to come back to over and over again as we're trying to interpret uh, Scripture. All right. So I told you that first part would be the longest. Now we're going to jump ahead uh, to the rest of Mark uh, chapter 10. Oh, before we do that, <clears throat> verse 10 through 12. Again, I think an important lesson for us, uh, especially in, in these times. <clears throat> it says, so they talked publicly. They taught publicly. He was tested when crowds were among him. And then in verse 10, it says, Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And that actually ties back to the Moses, Moses law. So you can compare those and why that would be important. But you see that it's done in the house. When he's asked these nuanced questions, he, he holds a very high bar in both public and private about marriage. Marriage is very important. It's very significant. It's part of God's creation. And when he talks about this in, in some nuanced forms, he talks about it with his closest friends in the house. And again, I think a great model for our conversation about Scripture is that when we have these hard conversations, having them in smaller spaces with close friends is a great place to have it with, with trusted people, uh, knowing that we might agree or disagree in, in those places, but we can have them as we study Scripture together. And so I'm so thankful for spaces like this where we can have uh, those kinds of conversations. Okay, <clears throat> moving forward. All right, Matthew 10, we've got about... Uh, we'll see, 15, 18 minutes more. We're going to go through this. Um, Matthew 10, verse 13. We're going we're gonna to do a series of, of four stories. And I'm going to tell you these four stories are going to be important stories. And again, just to, in the back of our mind, remember that in Matthew 11, we're going to start to move towards Jerusalem. And so in many ways, Jesus is preparing uh, his disciples and those listening uh, for what it would be, for, for what's going to happen at his crucifixion. So we're going to hear four stories, and I want you to hear all four stories uh, with this question in mind. We're going to hear it a little bit later on, but it's basically, basically the question about who is greatest in the kingdom of God. So who does Jesus think is the most important? Who does Jesus think is the greatest? Who should have the most status or stature? And does the kingdom of God and the values of the kingdom of God match the values of this world? So are they the same? And, and you see uh, Jesus inverting this a lot, where what the world says is important about people uh, is not does not always match up with what Jesus says is most important. So this is what we're going to hear. And these are very well-known passages, so uh, you may know and, and, and recognize many of them. Uh, Mark 10, uh, 13 uh, through uh, 16. Uh, people were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. So notice, these are his closest friends. And these are those that have been walking with him, and they are turning kids away from him. Verse 14, when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little, little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Uh, truly, I tell you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter into it or enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. So here you have children who would have been low in that culture, uh, not of much value. They aren't to interact with adults in that way, always to have a place in society, who are coming to Jesus and even Jesus' own disciples, the ones that have journeyed with him for all of his ministry in Galilee, all the first nine chapters from Mark, this is over half of Mark's gospel now, as they're preparing to go to Jerusalem where he will be crucified. 
those disciples are saying to these, to these parents, to these adults that are bringing children to Jesus, keep them away. And Jesus says, no, no, let the children come to me. Let the most vulnerable come to me. Let those who are innocent uh, come to me. And, and, and for all of you, let this be a lesson to you. If you want to fully engage with my kingdom, uh, then you have to be like one of these, like one of these young, these young innocent children who come uh, not with agenda, not seeking power, not of the rest of the things of this world, not burdened uh, with the rest of the things of this world, but, but simply coming to be with me. Uh, that becomes the, the message you hear. And again, as you think about that question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of God, uh, this becomes a vital part and answer to that question. Our children, or those that are like children, uh, actually to be raised up as models of what it means to be part of God's kingdom. All right, same question, different story. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? Verse 17, another familiar uh, story. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. Uh, you shall not steal. Uh, you shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I've kept all these since my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. And we're going to stop right there for a minute. Uh, so this is a, a passage that many of us know as uh, the rich young ruler. Uh, that's sort of the, the most robust name. Uh, and this one you just see it labeled, if you have NRSV, as the rich man. Uh, some of you will see as rich young ruler, but most of you just see as rich man. Uh, but I wanted to point out the other two uh, places you see this in the Synoptic Gospels, in Matthew and Luke. Uh, the first is um, Matthew 19, uh, verse 22. You see it in verse 19, or chapter 19, Matthew, verses 16 through 22. And then Luke 18, 18 through 23. Uh, those are on your uh, outlines as well. But I wanted to show kind of how sometimes these stories get, get pieced together uh, for the, the bigger story that we know. Uh, and so in Matthew 19, verse 22, uh, you see the intro is a little bit different. So in, in Mark 10, verse 17, in your Bibles, we'll see, as he was setting out on a journey, that's Jesus, a man ran up and knelt before him. So all we know about the man coming into this passage is that he was a man that came before Jesus. Now, eventually, we know he had many possessions, so we knew he was wealthy. Uh, but at the beginning, that's all we know is he was a man. <clears throat> uh, we know nothing about uh, his age in Mark. Uh, we don't hear anything about whether he was uh, young or old. Uh, all we hear is that he, he was a man that had great possessions. In Matthew, verse chapter 19, verse 22, uh, we see that uh, when the young man heard this word, this is towards the, the middle of that, uh, this is the first time we hear that he might be young. And so we begin to piece these stories together that it's not just a man with great possessions, but it's a young man, uh, which could give different context uh, to how he built his wealth, all those sorts of things. And then Luke 18, verse 18, because uh, in Matthew and Mark, we hear nothing about him being a ruler. Um, we hear this, a certain ruler asked him these questions. And, and you can read through that and see that's the same story, but this time it's a ruler that comes uh, to Jesus. And so often we'll piece these stories together from Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, sometimes John, and make a complete story uh, where Matthew, Mark, or Luke are emphasizing one point or the other. And so in this case, we do see now why we might call it the rich young ruler uh, in this passage. And so we see this. We see the story, and again, it's, a, it's an often quoted uh, story. But what I want to do is actually move the, the the rest of this and see several other quotes, and want to kind of put them in context for us as well. Um, so this is uh, Mark ten, verse twenty three through twenty three through thirty one. I'm going to read it uh, to us. Uh, then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, "How hard will it be uh, for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God?" The disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. 
Verse 25, uh, you probably have heard this quote before. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. All right, we're going to stop right there. And flip on your outlines to page four. So on page four, uh, you'll see a couple pictures. And uh, this is an image, again, that many of you probably have heard this. You may be, you probably have heard several sermons preached on it. Uh, some sermons will even tell you that uh, the camel, the, there's different ways to interpret this passage, uh, what it means for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. Uh, maybe it was the literal eye of a needle, um, the very little one. You see the, a comic uh, there at the bottom uh, of page four where it says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle uh, than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And then you see two rich men saying, uh, well, it's, sim it's simple, uh, we'll buy a bigger needle. <laughs> so uh, hopefully you saw that and get a laugh out of that today. And then above that, you actually see an image. Um, this is an image um, from Jerusalem uh, of what uh, many people have said uh, might be the, the, a passage called the Eye of a Needle uh, that a camel might have had passed through uh, that could be the, a literal passage that Jesus is talking about in this place. Um, that interpretation came about later on. Uh, several people have preached it. I think I've preached something similar myself. And the idea is that there was a passage that went through a, a side street, a secret street, street uh, near Jerusalem, that for a camel to get through it, it was possible. Uh, but to get through the passage, they had to take off all of the things that a camel might carry, uh, all of their bags, all of their uh, anything that any of the burdens that they were that they were carrying with them on the journey uh, to go through with nothing. And that's how the only way a camel could get through that uh, through that passage. And so, if you've been on a tour of Jerusalem, uh, I'm guessing that's a place that you've seen uh, that they it's likely a tour stop uh, there as well. Um, Scholars disagree. Uh, this is a, 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 something that came across uh, more recently, this idea of a passage. Um, really, the, the idea of hyperbole is likely here. Either way, Jesus is making a point, which is it's really hard. <laughs> like It's not something that's, that's easy or easily possible uh, for this to happen. But as we get further on, you're going to see, uh, I think, again, a really important shift for one of the quotes that we hear often. Uh, verse 26 uh, they were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? And this is a crucial question that we're going to come back to uh, in the fourth uh, story here. But what does salvation look like? If a wealthy person can't, if it's like a camel going through an eye of a needle, whether it's a literal eye of the needle or whether it's a, a passageway in Jerusalem where everything has to be stripped bare uh, to do that, then who can experience salvation? Uh, Jesus looked, looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Now that quote's an important quote. And it's one that I know I've seen in many places about what's possible with God. And in and, and other places, other uh, contexts, it might be about sports or about um, some circumstance we're going through or any, any other sort of way. But what's important here is, is to know uh, what God is interested in. For when God is interested in something, God is interested in salvation. That's what's possible with God. And salvation, uh, the holistic picture of salvation is about healing. It's about how we're made uh, right with God. We're made whole. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. But that's what God's interested in. Uh, God's not interested in us winning uh, ball games. Uh, God's interested in us um, you know, doing other things that might look nice on a t-shirt uh, or on a website. Um, what God's interested in is making possible a way for us to be in right relationship with God, salvation, that we might be made whole with God, healed uh, from our sin, from the things that keep us from God. That's what God cares about, uh, not all the rest of the things that we might tie this verse to. So it's a famous quote. I just want to bring that back to us uh, as well. We're going to continue. We're going to hit one more uh, kind of well-known quote uh, in this passage as well. It's a very quotable passage. Uh, verse 28. Peter began to say to him, look, we have left everything and followed you. Uh, Jesus said, uh, truly I tell you, uh, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake, and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. 
And so again, uh, we're, we're going to come back to this uh, as well as we move throughout, but this is the you know, part of the answer to that question. You know, who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? And what Jesus is doing and reminding them is that, that sometimes who we think are first, uh, who we put first in, in culture and in society, who we put first in, uh, in our hierarchies of class, socioeconomic class, uh, some of those that we might raise up uh, are never not the ones at all who are going to experience the fullness of God's kingdom. And sometimes the most vulnerable are the ones, that, in this case, children, in a minute, uh, a blind man, uh, are the ones that uh, are closest uh, to God. And it's just an important re reminder that Jesus is offering all, all of us. All right, verse 32. Another quick uh, reminder before we go into two other stories. And uh, we've got a few minutes left, but I'm going to fly through. Here we go. Uh, they were on the road uh, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. Uh, they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. He took the twelve aside again and began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, uh, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. They will, then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. So here's Jesus, um, who's foretelling his death, and we're going to come back to that in, in next week with Mark 11, where we're really headed down to Jerusalem. But again, reminding uh, even his disciples that he is the Son of Man. He's the Son of God. They've seen him do miracles. They've seen him uh, teach extraordinary ways. He will be uh, spit on and flogged. He will be uh, really the fulfillment of what we just heard in Mark uh, chapter 10, verse 31. He who should be first in God's kingdom, I should be treated like one of the lowliest of, uh, of anyone, uh, that he will be spit on and, and de uh, despised and ultimately crucified. Uh, but he, uh, after three days, will rise again. He will conquer uh, even uh, that uh, disparaging by the hands of, um, of the scribes, the Gentiles, and those that will come, uh, come for him. All right, uh, verse, uh, verse 35, another question about who was the greatest. Uh, James and John, uh, the sons of Zebedee, uh, came forward to him and said to him, A teacher, uh, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, uh, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, uh, Grant us to sit, uh, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Uh, they replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize, recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It is not so among you. Uh, but whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many." So you see, um, again, a, a often quoted passage uh, where uh, James and John come to Jesus and, and they ask him a question. He says, what, what, what do you want of me? What do you want me to do for you? And we're going to actually see that same question asked uh, in a minute uh, by, in a different context. So I want you to hold on to that. And they want to be next to his right hand and left hand. They want to be great. They want to be considered the greatest uh, among these disciples. And it causes this great fight uh, among the disciples where he Jesus begins to again teach them a different ethic. That what it means to be part of God's kingdom is not to be recognized as great among your peers. What it means to be recognized in God's kingdom is to, to be one who serves others, who sets your life aside for the sake of others. Um, <clears throat> I've done a couple of things in, in your outline. Um, one is I listed where these uh, passages are found again in Matthew and in Luke. In Matthew, it's in Matthew chapter 20 and Luke is Luke 22. In both cases, they're leading up to uh, going into Jerusalem, and so you see this being the last, the last part of Jesus's ministry. 
So he's preparing them for a different way of understanding what's about to happen. And then you see listed here as well, uh, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Uh, many of you know this is uh, my favorite passage in the New Testament. It talks about what Jesus does, who he is, the character of Christ. And it talks about Jesus himself is one who humbled himself to the point of death, uh, even death on a cross. And so Jesus is modeling what we just heard in Scripture. Be part of the kingdom of God uh, is to become humble, to, to not become, if you're going to be great among you, you must become a servant. You must uh, become less than uh, to serve all, slave of all. And that's what Philippians 2, 5 through, 5 through 11 really really talks about. <clears throat> all right, last passage. Beginning with verse 46. Um, they came to Jericho. Um, and so on your map, um, <clears throat> you'll see, uh, I'm going to flip back to the first page, to page 2. Uh, you'll see Jericho. Uh, Jericho is down here in the south. Uh, it's down here in Judea. Uh, it's east of Jerusalem. It's a little bit northeast of Jerusalem. And so you see that we're moving closer to Jerusalem. And so uh, presumptively, Jesus has moved from Galilee uh, down the Jordan River uh, all the way down now to Jericho, uh, where he's approaching Jerusalem uh, with his disciples. <clears throat> and so again, you see a large uh, crowd uh, following them. But he goes to Jericho as he was... Yeah, a, large crowd were leave, a large crowd were leaving Jericho. A Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, uh, Jesus, a son of David, have mercy on me. Uh, many uh, sternly ordered him to be quiet. So you see an echo of the first passage with the little children, uh, where those around them were telling this blind beggar, this is not for you. Uh, you're, you're not worthy, stay away, right? They're, they're urging him to not bother Jesus. Uh, but Bartimaeus uh, cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called a blind man, saying to him, I Take heart, I get up, uh, he is calling you. Uh, so throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and he came to Jesus. And then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, uh, let me see again. Some text is rabuna. You might know that as a, like rabbi, like an affectionate term for a rabbi, my teacher. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith made you well. Immediately he re regained his sight and followed him on the way. <clears throat> so uh, right there, verse 51, something I want us to recognize is um, Jesus asked uh, Bartimaeus uh, the same question that he asked James and John. Uh, Jesus asked James and John um, in verse 36, uh, what is it you want me to do for you? And here in verse 51, he asked Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do uh, for you? And so you see in both of these places a different question. For James and John, they want to be recognized as the greatest. Uh, for Bartimaeus, he wants to see again. He just wants to sight back. And so you see these two responses where Jesus condemns James and John. Uh, but he says to Bartimaeus, your faith has made you well. He says, your faith has saved you. And we're going to finish with that uh, in a second. Uh, two last things to note. Um, you're going to see uh, three different versions of this passage. Uh, one in Matthew um, 20, uh, verse 29 through 34. Um, I've put two quotes there to give you, again, an idea of how these stories get told and, and, and kind of brought together for a fuller story. Um, in Matthew 20, you actually see two blind men uh, sitting by the roadside. That's as opposed to just one. We don't hear his name, but we hear a very similar dialogue back and forth. Um, in Matthew 20, you also see Jesus touching the man. That's not what happens in, um, in Mark or in Luke. Uh, if you were in worship at the Apex campus this past weekend or watched this uh, as part of the live stream, I guess none, none of you were there. Uh, but if you watched the live stream, you saw uh, Pastor Laura, heard Pastor Laura preach on John chapter 9. Um, not, chapter 9 is not necessarily considered the same blind man, but you see Jesus again touch the blind man in that story. And so uh, sometimes we see these stories um, almost borrow from each other as they tell uh, a, an important, what they're trying to get the point across, what point they're trying to tell um, their audiences. And then in the back, this is page six, Luke 18. Um, you see a blind man again, a singular blind man uh, in Jericho, uh, sitting by the roadside begging. Um, 
And then you see this passage in, in verse 42 where Jesus says to them, receive your sight, uh, your faith has saved you. Uh, in Mark's gospel, it says your faith has made you well in RSV, but that translates uh, the same word salve, uh, salvation, to heal, to, to save you, is the same idea, to make you well, to be saved. Um, and I just want to close um, with this quote from N.T. Wright. Again, part of the essence of this whole passage in Mark's gospel is what's most important to God. And I said this a little earlier uh, when we talked about what's impossible with humans, with mortals, is possible with God. And what uh, Jesus is talking about there is not just uh, physical things, but it's this idea of salvation, that salvation is made possible because uh, in Christ all things are possible. And all things are that God makes a way where there is no way. Uh, this is what N.T. Wright writes about this passage. It's on your outline, page six. Uh, when Jesus says, your faith has saved you, the word saved refers once again to physical healing. Uh, for any early Christian, though, it would carry a wider and deeper meaning as well. The different dimensions of salvation were not sharply distinguished either by Jesus or by the gospel writers. God's rescue of people from what we think of as physical ailments on the one hand and spiritual peril on the other were thought of as different aspects of the same event. But again, not for the first time, we see that the key to salvation of whatever kind is faith. That's why anyone, even those normally excluded from pure or polite society, can be saved. Faith is open to all, and often it's the unexpected people who seem to have it most strongly. And faith consists not least in recognizing who Jesus is and trusting that Jesus has the power to rescue. I love that quote from N.T. Wright's book on Mark for Everyone. It just can sum up this chapter that that salvation, healing, uh, being made whole, being made right with God, the thing that is made possible by God is only made possible by God, but it's open to all of us. And it has nothing to do with our, our wealth or our, or our maturity or our status in society, but, but God makes God's salvation, God's healing, uh, open to all of God's people. And what a beautiful, a beautiful reminder uh, in Mark's gospel. All right. We are still under an hour, and so we are on time. Um, thank you for letting us do this. Hopefully it works well for my house this morning. Uh, hopefully you got a chance to connect. I'd love to, to hear from y'all. If you want to shoot me a text, shoot me an email on how it worked uh, from where from y'all are. Um, as we close, we normally close um, with uh, birthdays and anniversaries. Again, I would invite you to send those to Sandy and Sandy can send them out to all of us as a chance, maybe with prayer requests, uh, things we can pray for as well as uh, birthdays and anniversaries we can celebrate uh, as a community. Um, I will not sing because that would not be a gift to any of us. <laughs> um, but if you want to sing a birthday or anniversary wish to yourself, wherever you are, or just imagine that Norma is singing for you. Uh, and, and I wish all of you happy birthday um, or a happy anniversary um, as, as part of this as well. I miss you very much. I wish we could be together in person. I look forward to seeing you all uh, very soon. Um, as we go from this place, let me offer a prayer for us. Let's pray. Almighty God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for all those that can gather together this way over YouTube. I thank you that we can stay connected even when we are, even when we are distant from each other. Uh, keep us connected this week uh, through your Holy Spirit. Uh, help us to, to be with each other, to call each other, to email each other, to text each other, uh, to remind each other that we are loved and known. Uh, Lord, uh, help us uh, to know you better this day. Uh, help us to know your love, your peace, and be vehicles of your grace uh, to this world. In Christ's holy name, amen. Amen. Um, send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. Just tell me you were here this morning. Um, I'd love to just connect this week. So uh, again, my email's in the back, uh, tim.catlett at apexumcfamily.org. Miss you guys. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>